All right, welcome everyone to this sixth episode of Sam Gets Schooled. I'm here again with a special guest um, who is a supposed expert on a new topic, just like we do every week. Um, this week, I'm here with Adam. Hey, Adam. Hello. How are you doing, Sam? You're right. Yeah, I'm not too bad. Yourself? Yeah, pretty good. Not bad. I'm expecting. I'm expecting different things from you, though, if if, if I'm honest, because little do our podcast members know, but this podcast is transcontinental. That is absolutely correct. Yeah. I am in China at the moment and you are in the UK, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Presum- presumably. <yes. laughs> yeah. So uh, I have thought about the um, topic for a while, but I don't know yeah. if it's going to live up to the hype that you've just created there. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, let, let, let's break the tension if you can, because I'm excited as well. I, w- I want to know what I have to pretend to be knowledgeable about. Right. Okay. Uh, well, the topic that I have chosen, um, you told me that I need to think of something that I'm very passionate about. Yeah, ideally. And in conclusion, I thought of, well, I'm, I'm quite passionate about the Chinese language. And so, so what I'd like to talk about today is the basics of Chinese language, uh, a bit of the characters, sort of like what, how are they uh, made up? What's the different elements in the characters? And uh-huh. as a, as a bit of a fun topic, we can talk about what it's like as a foreigner living in China. Do you do you consider yourself an expert on these topics? Uh, as much as you can be, I suppose. Yeah, I I'd say I've as much as much as physically possible. Yes, as much okay. as physically possible. Where better to start than the than the supposed most difficult language to learn in the entire world? So is it really? I certainly don't think so, but. All right, Adam. It's been uh, it's been just over fifteen minutes. I've uh, frankly I've I've been lost in a sea of information, and I, I'm hoping you can be my guide. Um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best, but you know, welcome to my world. That's yeah. how it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, do you want do you want to give everyone a little bit of background as to why? I mean, we mentioned in the intro that that you live in China, therefore, probably knowing the Chinese language is pretty important. Um, but what, what, what do you want to talk about in this podcast? You know, what's your, what would you say is your area of expertise? Uh, well, like you said, I've been living in China for four years now. And it's, I, th- I personally think I've been, the best thing for me to talk about would be Chinese as a language, because that's like sort of what I've been doing for the past four years. And that's what I'm uh, most knowledgeable about. So I'd kind of like to just talk about the the basics of this language and why it is how it is and sort of how it matches up with other words and how you can create sentences and just just a bit of background information about it really. Yeah, great. So and obviously this is what someone who has almost no knowledge of Mandarin unlike m- me, you know, who's obviously now an expert um <laughs> might not realize is that just how vastly different it is to what I'm just going to term western languages. Absolutely, yeah, because it is, in essence, a completely different format. So uh, things like French, Spanish, English, you all have these different uh, letters that you that you piece together and that's how you create uh-huh. words. Yeah. Whereas Chinese is a completely different concept and it's all based on like, different radicals and different shapes of these characters. And, that, and when you put them together, it sort of it sort of portrays a meaning, which is which which could be seen through the different shapes like if it's the shape of a tree then you know the yeah. word has something to do with with wood basically and so yeah. it's a completely different way of uh, of creating language basically okay and, and for the time being we're just going to stick to mandarin as well which is kind of the i'm, I'm going to guess and say the most popular and um where, where everyone would start with uh, out of all the different chinese dialects that exist yeah, because when you say Chinese, I think a lot of people just think of Mandarin when that's uh-huh. technically not true. I mean, I think there's about 400 different dialects and right. it's so that, so Mandarin plenty to itself. Be on with. Yeah, but obviously nobody goes to learn the dialects. It's all about Mandarin or Cantonese, which is the other widely spoken version of Chinese. Yeah. Um, but actually Mandarin in itself is based on uh, Beijing dialect and 
because Beijing is the capital of China, that's sort of where um, the basis for for this national language came from. Because Mandarin is what's spoken in um, in the workplace, it's what's taught in schools. It is, by all accounts, the um, the language of the officials, as as I suppose you would call it in in uh, English. Okay, so so it's it's the it's the official version of Chinese, like state sponsored. Yeah, except of course for um, Hong Kong and a lot, and some other sort of special places within China, but Hong Kong primarily speaks Cantonese and English, I suppose. Are they are they vastly different the dialects? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah, the dialects within themselves they also have um, different categories. So, for example, in the south south of China. Um, that's where you sort of see a lot of Cantonese. And then a little bit north of that, you get like Min language, which is its own separate entity, really. And within that, there's about, um, well, anywhere upwards of um, 50 odd different dialects within that. Right. And because China is so so big and its um, terrain is so different, one of the main reasons why this language is so different is because of, uh, of how mountainous it is. So, for example, if one city is on the east side of a mountain yeah. and a different city is on the west side, mm-hmm. actually, in, in ancient civilization, there's no way for these two cities to interact with each other. And that's yeah, why yeah. Uh, it's, it's a similar sort of language system and it belongs to the same category, but actually it's completely different. And to, to both parties, each other's language is unintelligible. They can't understand it at all. Yeah, because dis- despite the fact that you know, we now observe China as a whole being being one country. You know, when these when these languages, I guess, were being developed, although it, there's, you know, it's fair to say they still are in development as well. But as you say, in ancient times, they they essentially evolved in isolation. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even it'll, it'll be to the point where um, even in one city, one because because the cities are a lot bigger than what you'd find in England. I mean, you say a city, and in England you think of, like, a place that maybe you could walk around in about an hour or so. Yeah, but so the like, cities like in China... Derby. Yeah, and, like, <laughs> in China, it's like... It's like um, the cities are so big. Actually, on one side of the city, there's also variations within the dialect that they speak, that they speak on the other side of the city, for example. And that's that's why Chinese as a concept is so massive and so huge. So... <laughs> I'm rambling a bit, but no, good. Uh, my main point is we should we should focus on Mandarin because that's what the people want to hear. That, yeah, well, yeah, literally. Um, <laughs> so, so you said that you mentioned a little bit before about the structure of characters, and I, I understand that that's something you that you do know quite a lot about, and it is quite an interesting concept to someone who's never really seriously looked at Chinese conceptually as a language so do you want to do you want to give me the gist of how a chinese character works you said something earlier when we were chatting about how they're like built and how they can be composed of of several different concepts together and then you also said that they're kind of pictorial absolutely yeah Uh, i bought a book recently that shows you the the process of how it goes from um, the original oracle bone script all the way to to modern day chinese characters and oracle bone script yeah, uh, that's that's basically what the first the first bits of Chinese language. That's where it all came from. Essentially, oh. it's what people would would do. Um, I think it was more of a religious thing in the beginning, if I'm not mistaken. And what they would do is they would find the um, shells of turtles or ox bones, and they would use sharp stones to write these yeah. characters in. Oh. And at that. At that stage, it, I think I can't. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's it's the vast majority of Chinese characters at that point were um, pictograms. So it would look like the thing it was trying to represent. And yeah, over yeah. time, it's gotten further and further away from that. But it still has a lot of uh, components where you can see that oh, it has this thing. So therefore, it's it's in it belongs to this field of language. Okay. So, for example. Um, so, for example, if you can imagine like a like a cross, like a, the red cross, yeah. and on each side of the the vertical line, oh no, sorry, on each side of the horizontal line, there's yeah. two lines going from the middle outwards, coming yeah. down like that. That would represent wood because it it looks a little bit like a tree. So, uh, in words like "xiang," which is the word for gun. Originally, guns were part wood as well. They have like wooden handles, so yeah, yeah. it's got wood in there. 
um, okay. so, for so things like... What you, what you end up having as well is that the words... I, I presume that word is still used for gun now, even though, you know, pretty much no guns yeah. are made of wood. But you end up with a bit <laughs> yeah. of like history and legacy kind of cemented in, into the language. Yeah, and it and it, it it becomes so far apart from what the original concept was that yeah. you sort of lose lose. How could this thing mean mean that? It's like it, it becomes so far away from it. But actually, it is yeah because Chinese has a history of five thousand years, so that's a long yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a long time for this language to develop, and that's why if you understand Chinese characters, you can actually understand a lot about history as well. Okay, yeah, because because the language has evolved, you know, alongside the culture and the the, the politics and everything else that, and technology as well that goes and yeah. therefore it goes hand in hand with it. Absolutely, yeah, and so and so even though it's lost some of its original meaning, you can still sort of figure it out, and you can still really, um, I suppose, you can sort of see why it's developed the way it has and even though it's different from modern modern day and how we describe these things it still has that uh, essence of of what the object is in itself kind of thing yeah so what about um what about the creation of new characters what what how i guess my question would be is that when you come across a word you've never seen before in english because english is is what i'm going to describe as a phonetic language using the letters you can kind of sound it out and and then that doesn't actually tell you much about the meaning unless it's kind of a composite word but you can at least say it out loud and, and be able to work out how it's spoken how does that whole process work in a language like chinese well with chinese i suppose one reason uh, one method that the government have has used to try and uh, change Chinese so you can actually almost guess how you would pronounce these words would be having yeah. a radical at the side. So um, if it's metal, well, then you know it's got something to do with metal. And there's a part of it that is just for the pronunciation. So sometimes you can you can separate um, a Chinese character into two different parts yeah. and you can look at what, what sort of um, area would it be, uh, what is it about, and then you look at the other part to guess how you would how you would pronounce that. And, that, and that's all contained in, in one character. Yeah. Well, um, originally, obviously, when Chinese was first created and they're, they're creating all of these different characters, it was one character has one sound. Yeah. And then as time progresses and concepts become uh, more and more complex and course, you yeah. want to you want to create more characters to, to fill that void that's being created by our uh, development as a race, yeah. then what what happens is... Um, they take these two different ideas and they put them together. And what I said about the um, radicals, I suppose, would be that's just a very small part. It, it all sort of gets squished down a little bit and the two different parts of what was originally two different words become one and that's how you c can create new words. Yeah, so I guess the, the, the critical part is being very intensely familiar with all the different kinds of characters that exist because as they get as you say, like squashed together and kind of used in different ways, I imagine they get changed slightly. And therefore, I, I imagine that could be very difficult to a new learner trying to be able to separate kind of the different composite parts of what were yeah, several characters yeah. now put together. Absolutely, it can. Yeah. I mean, um, if you look at it's it's used to talk about claws, really, like um, cat claws, yeah. dog claws, um, uh, the, 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 there's a word that is now has it's it depends what word it's in but for example um dra which is the word for a claw yeah. um in the word fu which is actually now um it's a claw on the top of a child which sounds a bit horrific really i mean yeah. like a claw <laughs> going towards a child or whatever but the the dra has changed so it's actually no longer the same shape but it's still got the same um basic idea and yeah. what that means is actually like lifting a child up so um so sort of promoting his study um oh. helping him to learn more it's it's like that kind of idea so yeah the, the characters do change quite a lot actually um in shape as well almost to the point where you can't recognize it anymore and you have to have somebody tell you that that's what it is and that's how you can figure it out okay yeah so you figure it out by having someone else t tell you what it is yeah that's why i'm happy i uh I had a Chinese Chinese teacher for the past four years. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, uh, 
so that that concept we were laughing before is is kind of the Chinese is Lego, in that you yeah. can you can build and disassemble Chinese characters, but unlike Lego, um, every single brick is a different shape. Yeah, absolutely, and it's not. I mean, in essence, Chinese is Lego. The only yeah. difference is uh, Chinese is vastly more complex, and it's not as fun as Lego. Yeah, great. So <laughs> it, this is an awful metaphor. No, it's pretty. It's pretty good for me. It's interesting for me. It's as it's as fun as playing Lego, if not more fun. Which I know is a uh, is a bit out there, but yeah. As someone go. who's very accomplished in Mandarin, and I presume some parts of other dialects, uh, it's fun. Yeah, I well, I, I personally think so. But <laughs> uh, talking <laughs> about the dialects, um, you'll notice that a lot of a lot of children are born into what is essentially a bilingual family. Uh-huh. So they they retain their ability to speak um, dialect or, you know, wherever they're from, and Mandarin, yeah. just because of the environment that they grow up in. So uh, a large percentage of, of Chinese people are actually born into bilingual or trilingual families just because of this um, this amazing effort to sort of keep dialects alive and not let them die out, which I think is really cool. I mean, I'd love yeah. to be born into a family like that. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. And actually, this relates to uh, another podcast which listeners can go back and listen to, which was when Kate... Um, told us about Arabic and and Arabic has again very many different dialects spread out across very many different parts of the world but unlike uh, and I presume something similar to what you're describing happens with them as well um, because there are there are moderns there's something called modern standard Arabic which is kind of the the universal um, formal type but then pretty much wherever you go there's there's a more colloquial type Um, and and then if you want to if you want to listen if you listen to a lot of uh, music or film in arabic then that's probably going to be in egyptian arabic as well so you've probably got some amount of familiarity with a huge range of dialects just almost out of necessity yeah it's it is um it's a very similar idea yeah and even being in china um being a foreign student or an international student in the university that i'm studying at uh, I come across a lot of people uh, who do speak Arabic and they're telling me that, you know, how how different it is as a language depending where you come from and how yeah. and how that's so different talking to people like with that through accents or through words that are used. I yeah. suppose it's it's a similar idea, uh, not uh, not on such an extreme scale really, but um between the UK and America and how we use different different words and and how um you know the world perceives yeah. what is standard English. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, but maybe it's hard for for me because I have no third party perspective on English, not knowing any other languages realistically. But there are different spellings and different intonations and and accents. But what I'm imagining is that what we're describing in in Mandarin and and the other dialects is to a greater extent than what we would probably term in English as as just like a, a change of accent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What I often make that comparison. What is essentially a, a different accent in the UK is a completely different language in China. Right. But again, <laughs> there's this there's this Mandarin that ties everybody all together, which is uh, which is what they learn in schools, and that's how that's how people communicate with each other. If there wasn't Mandarin, it would just be it would just be like thousands of years ago when nobody knew what the hell was going on. Right. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, you you said earlier that that. Chinese, um, and I'm just going to refer to Chinese as Mandarin now, um, okay. as being p- supposedly the hardest language in the world to learn. But you don't potentially agree with that. Why is, why is that the case? Did you find it? I mean, is it just that you were kind of enthralled with it and that maybe overcame the difficulties because you just were hungry for more? Or do you think yeah. there's, there's something about Chinese which, which kind of really suited you? I think I think it's a bit of both. I, I mean... As long as you've got an interest in something, then you can learn it. Um, you know, you can you can do it with the best of them. But uh, I think for me, it was just I had a gap in my life at that point, and yeah. Chinese just just happened to fill that, and that's what I was interested in. And I think the reason why I I don't agree that Chinese is such a difficult language is just because if you take it slow, actually, there's so much reason behind why it is the way it is. Yeah. And of course, you know, because it is a tonal language, which is a completely different idea from what, what English is, 
um, the first time you hear it, you might be put off by it and you, you could sort of think, oh, it sounds like, um, to quote somebody I used to work with, it sounds very sing-songy. Right, yeah. So it's, so, so it's a completely different way of expressing yourself and talking to, to, um, to other people. But for me, it's, it's just so interesting. I mean, one word, uh, for example, I was telling you about tones. Uh, yeah. So for people who don't really know what tones sound yeah, that, like, that was gonna there's be my, four different ones. That was going to be my question, if I'm honest. The, the, if you can kind of dig a little bit deeper in, in what, what even a tonal language means. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, how about... Well, f- well first of all, I'll, I'll tell you um, just the number of tones. There's four. Five if you include a, a toneless word. Uh, and okay. if you make a comparison between between Mandarin and uh, Changsha Hua, which is uh, a, a language that they speak in Changsha in the south of China, yeah. um, which has nine tones, so I don't know right, what okay. that would sound like because I'm used to I'm used to just four. But uh, how about I I go through the tones and you see if you can do them do them with me. <laughs> right. Okay. I'll uh, I'll do my okay. best. Okay. You have to so coach the first me, tone. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Uh, the first tone is you want to sort of pitch your voice up almost like you're singing a, a clean note and you want to keep it as high as you can without it wavering or quivering. So uh, we'll use ah, we'll, we'll use this word ah, uh, uh, and we'll put the tones on top of it. So okay. I'll say it and then you say it. Okay, you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Here we go. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. That was lower, but <laughs> it was lower. But actually, it, it's not the the pitch of it; it's just the the, the overall sound, I suppose. Uh, so that that's what's known as the as the first tone. Yeah. The second tone is is rising. So um, so it's almost like you're asking a question, and it's ah. Yeah. Okay. So that this is this is I think probably what what English people would be quite familiar with, because like you said, it, it's essentially the intonation you use to make a a spoken word a question. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I'm gonna go. So I'm it, gonna go with ah. Pretty good. Yeah, but it's just still a little bit too too heavy on the low end. Just ah. Okay. Ah. Yeah. All right. Now the third one, which uh, causes a lot of problems for foreigners, is um, it goes down and back up again. And ideally, you want to spend as much time going down as you do coming back up again. So it's like ah. Okay. Right. So. I'm going to go, ah. Yeah, not bad. Ah. Ah. It's quite sharp yeah, on the... Yeah, not bad. Yeah, well, it can, it can be slower depending on, uh, on your personal preference, I suppose. Yeah. And the last one is um, probably the easiest for foreigners to, to pronounce um, because it is, it's just going straight down. So it's almost... It's, it, it's very natural for us to to say this i've noticed and i'll often get the tones confused and make it into a fourth tone because that's very natural to me mm, uh, yeah. when i'm speaking and it is just ah ah yeah i can i can mm-hmm. see why that's so natural it is isn't it yeah it's right ah ah so uh if you put the four tones together it's ah 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 just okay. like that do you mind if i don't try that that's absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my second point would be uh, if you if you take um, a different word and you put a different tone onto it, uh, these four different tones actually um, express different meaning. So, if you m if you express m a ma, which means mum, ma, which means like uh, hemp, right, ma, which means horse, right. and ma, which means to scold somebody, to tell somebody off. Okay, so that there's a lot of uh, potentially dangerous meanings there yeah and what it (laughs) what it means is that um if you get the tone wrong actually you're saying a completely different word or even more possible would be that you're saying a word that that doesn't actually exist because a lot of them are um they they have hasn't been an allocated tone to this word so so ma is is uh is special in that all four tones have been used yeah, which is exactly why it's used to to demonstrate the point that I just made there. Yeah. Okay. So great. that was chosen with with particular with particular meaning. Classic Mandarin. Classic Mandarin. Yeah. Okay. Always always messing about with the tones. Yeah. So um, and then you said in in another different dialect in the south of China there are there are nine tones. So that's that's nine yeah. different kinds of sets of intonation. Yeah. 
and I, you, you don't want to ask me how that would sound because I have no idea at all. I mean, it took me long enough to get to get familiar with the the four different tones. Well, yeah, I know. You you, you have to, to start layering nine. things a lot more complicated because we've already used kind of the three most basic things and then a slightly more complicated one, staying the same, up, down, and then down, then up again. So so suddenly exactly. you're going suddenly what, what, you're what, gonna start getting a, a, be... lot, a lot more different kind of... Um, back-to-back different kind of modulations yeah and that would just that would just sound crazy i I don't think i'd be able to figure out what's going on if somebody started speaking to me with nine different tones yeah okay so that's that's really interesting so so the same basic noise can have has like another layer on top of it and that that's what it's that's what it means by it being tonal in that the exact intonation rather than the exact note that you say is what infers part of the meaning yeah and it and it is um i think it's similar to um vietnamese i believe i I think that is also a tonal language and they have borrowed quite a bit from the chinese language uh, as has uh japanese and korean as well yeah Uh, and but but i think that korean and japanese isn't so much a tonal language not not especially not in the same way that mandarin chinese is that's for sure yeah so they, they've kind of borrowed elements of it but it's not quite as as pure tonal as as you would say chinese is yeah i think over time the the only way to see that korean and japanese um has chinese elements in there would be from the written text i suppose mm-hmm. like you see a lot of um a lot of things in uh, japanese writing is actually the traditional chinese character that just hasn't hasn't been obviously because um japan and china are different countries yeah, yeah um at one point when the language was going over to japan they at that point they were all using traditional chinese characters and that sort of stuck with japan and they haven't changed to the simplified versions so that's why you when you see a chinese character in the japanese language it's still in the traditional traditional um layout yeah because i, I do know a little bit of history from about japan um from there there's a really interesting video i might i might share with the audience um which is like the entire history of like basic history of japan in like five minutes or something and i think to begin with they essentially stole and then just began using the chinese language but then that again like we mentioned before developed in isolation and is now vastly different yeah and that's it's the same idea with um accents as well because that's just just that's just how they're created because it's isolated from the outside world. And then the people who use that, they find a system that's comfortable for them. And then that changes according to, you know, what type of person's using it, um, where it is, what needs do they have for this language? What do they need yeah. to talk about? And that's just that's just how language is. That's just how it changes. Yeah, exactly. So, And I think that's something interesting as well that you mentioned, is that what, what do people need from a language? And that's that's how you end up with words in some languages which describe a concept or an idea which there isn't a single word or or concept in another language to describe um i know for example in some languages can be very poetic and have and have specific words to describe very specific kind of ideas whereas i think maybe this isn't true but in english i think we rely a lot on metaphors and and similes to to take the place of kind of an individual descriptive word Yes, yeah, I would agree with that, yeah, more so than Chinese. And a lot of Chinese uh, customs and greetings are all to do with food. Right. I think it must be because they've gone through a time in their history where food became a real problem and a lot yeah. of people were starving to death. And that's why it's so common when you talk to a Chinese person. The first thing they say to you, they open their mouth and they say, have you eaten? Have you eaten food yet? Oh, right. Uh, or they say, uh, where are you going? Are you going to go eat food? Yeah, and there's so so many so many different customs and um, ways of talking to each other that all revolve around food. Yeah, and that's why Chinese food is so uh, is so delicious because that's what they've been doing with the five thousand years. They've been cooking up delicious food and thinking <laughs> of ways to talk about it. Yeah, good. I, I think that that's true of a lot of culture. Um, in that you know, people need to eat is what it comes down to, and people normally eat quite a few times a day. Um, but it sounds like in the in the chinese language it's like way more colloquial it's kind of just like you know how you doing or something like that no one actually asks you how you're doing it's just a way of opening a conversation 
yeah, could you imagine if you said, how are you doing, bud? And then the guy starts, like, giving you his life story. It's just like, you, that's not what you're after. You're just simply saying hello to him, basically. And that's what it is with Chinese as well. If somebody asks you, have you eaten? And you say, hey, how are you doing? It's just like, that's that's fine. That's 100% fine. They're just like, hey, okay, cool. Well, we've said hello to each other, and that's that yeah. was my aim anyway. I wasn't really asking you if you've eaten. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let, let's swap topics slightly and talk about what it's like being an Englishman in Beijing. Okay. Um, so, so I'm gonna gonna give a bit of intro. Like we said, you went to you went to China about four years ago, fresh faced, foreign. Um, what was that? What was that like as like an initial uh, experience? Well. Um... The biggest thing I noticed straight away was just the difference in temperature. It was so right, humid, okay. so hot. Yeah. That was like, I know that has nothing to do with language, but yeah. it was <laughs> it was such a big thing. I, I remember the airplane doors went up. I stepped out and it was just like being hit by a wall of heat. Yeah. And I started sweating straight away. And I was thinking, why am I wearing this fleece? You know, <laughs> if, I'm, if I've got a vest, that's enough for me. <laughs> uh, and then, and then... I, I, do, I do remember I, I took a bus back to this little tiny town where I spent my first year in China. Yeah. And it, it was a, it was like, um, there'd just been this summer rain and it was really, it was a little bit cooler than it was in Shanghai, which is where I for, uh, yeah. originally landed. Um, but it was still really hot. And I sort of, um, I got out of this taxi cab and I, I went over to my friend who was waiting for me, um, because we, I'd arranged to s- sort of stay with her for a bit. Yeah. And, and everyone around me was speaking something that wasn't Mandarin. It was all this, uh, it was dialect. And I thought, right. why did I spend seven months learning yeah. this? And I, <laughs> I, I still can't understand what is happening. Uh, I, I think, I think you sort of have to just, just sort of get on with it a bit, really. Um, when you, if you do come to China, you're sort of putting a lot of, put in situations that maybe back in England you wouldn't feel so comfortable with. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of people asking you, you know, um, how much money do you make? Are right. you married? Uh, how much do you weigh? Are you right. looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend? It's it's all very direct and it's straight to the punch. Right. Um, and I noticed one of the, one of the biggest things that I felt was different was uh, like work ethic. Yeah. So um, in China, there's there's sort of an idea of everything that is foreign uh, is just good. Oh. It's good in itself just because it just because it's not Chinese, um, which is a bit of a weird, yeah, a weird absolutely. idea considering that so many things are made in China. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yes, so I so I got there to this tiny city, and almost straight away I was asked if I would be willing to teach English, which is something that's very common for um, foreigners to do, especially people from Western countries yeah. who come to China. Um, they get approached quite a bit asking them if they can if they can work as an English teacher yeah and what I know I was I was so nervous about it the first time I went to do uh well, I went to teach a class I was so nervous I was shaking in front of all yeah, these kids yeah. and I was thinking what am I supposed to do and the boss was there sat in the back of the room watching me yeah and I was like what am I supposed to do and after about four years of of sort of doing this and, and realizing that the most important thing is I'm a white guy I'm here with Chinese kids. I'm teaching them like a little bit of English yeah. and that's really good for the school. And how I do that, how I teach this class isn't so important actually. Really? So that's what I mean by, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not about how well you can do it. It's just about, you know, do you fit the criteria? Are you foreign? Um, you know, are you young enough? And, and that's it. And if you've got fa- these two and things. You, and you then, fitted the criteria. So, and that's what I you've been the, doing. Since. Just, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of my, um, that's how I make a living, I suppose, by doing yeah, bits, that's bits your, and pieces that's your every now and then. Story. That's my origin story. Yeah, and uh, it's not as interesting as Batman, but <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, yeah, the main thing I'm doing is still learning Chinese, and that's where my interests lie, really. Yeah, uh, and I th- I think it's like. There's a, there's such a difference in the way that people, people think about things. It's so common for, like, like an example I gave somebody else would be, if you were to fall over in a, in a crowded Chinese street, all you have to do is stand up, dust yourself off, pretend like nothing happened, keep walking, and nobody will remember it. Nobody will say anything about it, because it's just like, 
you know, the streets are so crowded yeah. or it's just that mentality of, you know, this is my space. This is what I'm doing. Uh, if something else happens, well, that's nothing to do with me. Right. This is what I'm focusing on right now. And it, 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 in a way, it's really, it's really, it gives you a lot of freedom, I think, yeah. to sort of, you just look like you belong, look like you, you know, you're meant to be there and that's it. You're done. No problems. If you fall over, spill something on yourself. You know, something embarrassing happens. Eh, forget about it. Nobody, nobody cares. Nobody's looking at you. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's all right. You, you mentioned and, earlier uh, <laughs> slightly about. Sorry, go on. Finish your story. No, 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 no. No, I was just going to say and and then just leave a massive gap. Okay, great. So, so I'll fill the gap by saying you you mentioned slightly that the 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 part of the reason part of the criteria you had to fill is that you were foreign and that you were like a native English speaker. Um, is there if that's your, you, you arrived in China and you had all these different kind of wildly different experiences to what you, th- what maybe you thought you'd have and what you had back home. But what do you think it's like on the flip side? How do Chinese people see you? I think, I think they feel that there's a definite gap between us. You know, right. if, if, if a Chinese person starts talking to you, then it's either because you're, maybe buying something from them or there's a need for this interaction between you both. I would yeah. personally say there's usually quite a bit of distance between uh, foreigners and Chinese people. Right. Which is which is kind of sad really. But yeah, on yeah. the flip side, I don't I don't want it to all be negative about um about Chinese people because actually Chinese people are really nice and I think it's on par with um the way that Japanese people are where if you learn if you make an effort to learn their language, yeah. they're really, really supportive of that. They really like it. Uh, something that I've that I've um, come across before is, mm-hmm. uh, for example, when I first got to China, you get into a you get to a taxi cab and you say uh, hello to them in Chinese, and they turn around to you and they say, "Wow, so amazing! You can speak Chinese. It's oh. <laughs> it's it's no different than a Chinese person speaking Chinese." Yeah, and yeah. then four years later, I know I've improved. I know that there's that I that I'm a lot better than I used to be, and yeah. it's still the same reaction. Just no matter how how well you, uh, how good you are at this language, yeah, uh, there's there's such a positive reaction, which I really love. That's that's, yeah, that's one amazing. of the things. Yeah, and I think if I didn't have that, I probably wouldn't learn. Uh, up until the point that I that I'm at now, to be honest, I think if I didn't have that encouragement, maybe I would have given up quite a quite a long time ago. Yeah, like literally everyone's cheering you on. Yeah, and it it, it really is, and a, a lot of foreigners have uh, have noticed that, and they've and they uh, make jokes about it. But I I think it's really nice. It's yeah. really good. Yeah, it is. And then so so that that's talking a bit now about what it's like four years on. How is your how is things? I presume things are kind of easier for you now in terms of day-to-day life but what what does that what does that mean how is your how is your life different compared to when you first got there well um if we're looking at it from a language uh, point of view i would say that my um opportunities have uh, also increased you know as yep. time goes on and you learn this language more uh-huh. and more opportunities are presented to you so it's kind of like um, I knew a guy from England who'd been in China for nine years, and yeah. I think the the limit the the amount of Chinese he could he could say was probably about "Hello, how are you? I want that one. How much money?" Really, and that's fine for him. Yeah, that's fine for him because that's because he works in an English school. Uh, yeah. That's you know that's his that's his job. He's in a very close knit circle of friends that all speak English. So there's so. so for him, there's no real need mm. and there's no real mm. real drive for him to learn Chinese uh, any any more than what he's learned already. So that's fine for yeah. him. But uh, on the flip side, you'll see a lot of foreigners now on Chinese TV speaking Chinese. Yeah. Um, and they, they're really successful. Yeah, Chinese people love it. They love somebody who's learning Chinese as a language and they make an effort to, to get involved in the... In, in Chinese life, I suppose. And I I think that because I've learned Chinese uh, for four years now and I'm a lot better than I used to be, um, now I can actually talk to people in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do before, which allows me to understand a lot more. And it's yeah, like that whole thing of travel broadens the mind. And I think yeah. if you go to a place, you learn the language, well, that gives you even more opportunity to to understand the culture and to realize things that you might not have known before absolutely because 
no, as as we said that being able to speak the language efficiently and being able to talk to such a broad range of people not only opens a lot of gateways but the chinese language itself is very rich and kind of um full of culture and history itself so it's it's a bit of a, a double edged sword in a good way yeah i suppose it is and that's probably why a lot of people have such a a fear of the chinese language i suppose they sort of see it and they think oh that's a bit too much i don't think i'd ever be able to learn that and then they just yeah. that's mm. it that's that's the that's the end of their interaction with the Chinese language. So it's, it's, it's sad in a way, but um, I think if you just spend a bit of time learning it, you really can, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can achieve quite a lot of things, really. You can, you can make a good life for yourself in China. Yeah. All right, good. So uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, it's, we've, we've gone on a little bit longer than we expected. So thanks, Adam, for coming on and um, telling us about the Chinese language, but also more specifically and, and personally what it's like to move and, and live in China. Um, I think I've, I've learned a lot, actually, and I've gained a lot, certainly into the more technical sides of the, the language, loads more kind of insight into how it works. And I guess that's actually removed some of the mystery and therefore some of the, I don't want to say I was afraid of it, but I think realistically, before we started talking about it, I, I generally held the perception that it, it was kind of like way out there and kind of like even beyond comprehension to someone who didn't really like spend a serious amount of time and i'm not saying that we've literally covered the chinese language in the in this short talk but at the very <laughs> least I, I feel i feel kind of it feels way more approachable already yeah well that's uh i'm glad that you you said that because that's sort of the aim that i was uh i was uh hoping to achieve by the end of this thing because it because it isn't as difficult as a lot of people are thinking and yeah just give it a go if you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in chinese just do it man just do it yeah all right good so thanks everyone to uh thanks everyone who's been listening um we all really appreciate it uh thanks to adam for taking the time out to come on and have a chat with us uh i hope we can all hear from you again i think it's a really interesting topic and there's no doubt loads more you can talk about Thanks again and bye bye. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was good. Yeah, see you. Bye bye. Well, that was episode six of Sam Gets Schooled. Thanks very much to Adam for coming on, for taking the effort, and uh, for choosing such an interesting topic. If you're interested in coming on and talking on Sam Gets Schooled, you're interested in all kinds of topics. If you're lucky enough to know me, you can uh, get in contact directly or you can email samgetschooled at outlook.com. Thanks very much again and ta I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to try and pump us up, all right? Okay. I'm ready to be pumped up. All right. Get ready to be, get ready to be pumped from afar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> it's working. Pumped from afar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, okay.